Doing the Black Girls with Queen, I wanted to give a shout out to Ring IQ Boxing and remember to tune in to the motherfucking relay. Welcome to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Well, the Nevada Commission approves top rank dates for June 9th and June 11th in Las Vegas. The Nevada State Athletic Commission approved two dates Wednesday for promoter top rank to stage boxing shows in June at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. ESPN will televise those cards on a Tuesday night and a Thursday night, respectively. I've been working with the executives from top rank. Bob Bennett, the Nevada State Athletic Commission's executive director, said during the meeting, I've reviewed their operations plan. They're still in the process of completing it. It's very comprehensive. We're moving in the right direction. I'm pleased to see that we are all working in concert with a closed system event, and I expect it to be very successful. The Nevada State Athletic Commission has five additional dates listed on its official calendar, but the events scheduled for June 16th, June 18th, June 23rd, June 25th, and June 30th were not on the agenda for approval during Wednesday's remote meeting. Now, this timeline of events, the resurgence, the return of the sport of boxing is in keeping with the timeline I specified weeks and now months ago in a previous video and I'll leave the link to that video in the description box Ox. on June 9th we are going to be treated to Shakur Stevenson versus Puerto Rico's own Felix Carballo at a prescribed weight of 130 pounds this is going to be Shakur Stevenson's super featherweight debut the chief support for this June 9th card will be a match between Michaela Mayer and seasoned veteran Helen Joseph per Mike Kofinger's sources also on the card are three of top ranks prospects, heavyweights Jared Anderson, Guido Vianello, and featherweight Robisi Ramirez, a two-time Olympic gold medalist. All things considered, it does sound like a solid night of boxing. But for those hard critics out there who are difficult to please, you know, what they want to see are those mouth-watering matches that we were anticipating before COVID-19 shut everything down. For those individuals, I have to say, you need to get real. You should really be grateful that there's even any boxing at all for you to tune into, given what's been going on around the world. This is in keeping with the timeline I specified several weeks and months ago, but all things considered, this is still cause for celebration. Even if these aren't the mouth-watering matches you were hoping to see before COVID-19 affected all of our day-to-day -day lives, this is still cause for celebration as it indicates some sense, some return to normalcy. It's baby steps. They are still steps in the right direction. I told you guys weeks ago, don't expect the feist fights we see coming out of this global pandemic to be the bigger matches that we were waiting for. The feist fights we're going to see are smaller fights, smaller events. We're easing back into a regular schedule. Those bigger fights, those bigger matches that you and I were waiting for, we're not likely to see those kinds of fights until sometime in the fall, maybe in the winter, late into 2020. For now, take what you can get because that's all you can get. And you know what? It ain't half bad. Mayer versus Joseph as a fight has some of the same intriguing elements that Mayer versus Hernandez would have had, all things considered. And we'll talk about that fight more comprehensively in another video. You think about Shakur Stevenson versus Felix Caballero. And that's just as good a fight as Stevenson versus Mariaga. I mean, there's no need to be a harsh critic given the circumstances. The boxing fans, the real boxing fans, should be appreciative that a little less than two weeks from now, boxing is back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I made the decision to switch over from what was my month-to-month -month subscription to DAZN and decided to upgrade to the annual subscription in support of the kind of content DAZN has provided thus far since launching in America. Essentially what I'm getting at is the boxing fans, the real boxing fans need to come out in full force and support whatever cards are being staged as we transition out of this global pandemic because boxing as a sport is hurting right now. We as the boxing fans, the consumers, are the lifeblood that fuels the big machine. Thus, whatever support we can lend to the sport, we should lend to the sport. If we cannot attend certain events here and now, what we can do is contribute via our own viewership. This card on June 9th 
It's going to be in the absence of a live audience, and you can forget about Press Row. Even the pundits aren't going to be allowed to go to this thing. So what we can do... Here and now. ...show our support, show our patronage by way of viewership. Let's make sure that these fights get watched so that we can see that many more of them moving forward as we and the sport of boxing as a cumulative transition out of this global pandemic. That's what we can do. All things considered, this is encouraging news in keeping with the timeline I previously specified, and I'm anticipating that the bigger fights, the bigger matches that we were waiting for before COVID-19 shut everything down will take place sometime later on this year in the fall or winter months. But as stated... This is cause for celebration. Moving on. Usyk smiles. Chizora can throw all he wants. He needs to land. A portion of the article reads, Usyk did not exactly look impressive in the contest, which promoted Chizora and his manager, David Hay, to question whether the unbeaten boxer can withstand a tough physical fight at heavyweight. Chizora plans to come forward press the action, and let his hands go at a high volume rate. Normally, I face this kind of plan every fight, Usyk told Sky Sports. If you want to hit the target, you need to see the target. Because he can throw as much punches as you can, but you need to land them into the target. When I was an amateur, I was watching his fights as a heavyweight with Klitschko, David Hay, and I was thinking, wow, such great guys somewhere far away, and now I'm going to box one of those great guys myself. Chizora recently admitted in an interview that it will be quite difficult to find sparring partners who can replicate the style of Usyk. I'm going to focus on what I do. I'm going to focus by going in the ring and start looking for my man, and that's it. He's going to dance around, but we've got certain things we've been practicing and things we've been doing every day. It will pay off. This fight between Alexander Usyk and Derek Chisora hasn't lost any of its intrigue over time as the question that hangs over this fight is a existential question. Yeah, it is. At least for Usyk it is. Can he really hang? Can he really bang with the big boys? I mean, you're talking about dancing around this guy, how you've got to hit the target, all that jazz, and it sounds good, it sounds great. But at the end of the day, the question for Usyk is, can he avoid being hit? by a strong volume puncher who can take a punch for 12 full rounds. Oh. Derek Chisora is not the least bit subtle and there aren't very many subtleties and nuances to his strategy. But those things aside, well. knowing what he's trying to do doesn't exactly make it easier to work around, does it? It's a yes or no kind of question. Can you deal with this guy or can you not deal with this guy? It's that simple. If you can't get Derek Chisora's respect, he's going to be willing to take one, to give one, to push you around and make you uncomfortable, force you to fight, force you to trade. You know, I recall his second match ch out ch with ch Dillian ch White. In that rematch, Derek Chisora was very much the aggressor, whereas Dillian White opted to box and move behind his jab. Looked a lot like Derek Chisora was on his way to winning a decision behind being the busier boxer. But ultimately, what ended up availing Dillian White in that situation was a big left hook that sparked Derek Chisora clean out, effectively turning the tide in one fell swoop. You'll excuse me for saying so, but I am unsure that if Usyk finds himself in a similar situation to the situation Dillian was in, that he can do the same. Put out Derek the way that Dillian White put out Derek. Oh, granted that Usyk exhibits a lot more polished skill and nuance, subtleties, than a Dillian White does. But a Dillian White has all of the size and punching power that here today we are unsure of when it comes to Usyk. You know, that Jorge Linares versus Pablo Cano fight at 140 pounds, that comes to mind. It's a situation, was a situation, to where we know that Jorge's a more skilled boxer than a Pablo Cano, and we even know that he was a more accomplished boxer than a Pablo Cano. Jorge Linares was a three-division champion. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, going up to 140 pounds was one division too many for Jorge, as it was Pablo Cano's size that he could not deal with. Could that happen to Oleksandr Usyk? That is the question. It's not far-fetched at all to say that, you know, Derek stands a fighting chance here. He does. It's not a foregone conclusion that Usyk wins this fight. It really isn't. I don't know when exactly the people over there at Matchroom plan on staging this thing. Do they plan on waiting? Do they plan on waiting until the fall or winter months before they decide to go ahead with this thing when they feel it's safe to stage big fights in front of big crowds? Because if they do, 
if they wait until, I don't know, October, it will have been a full year's time since Oleksandr Usyk had a fight. That Chaz Witherspoon fight. That fight was in October of last year. If you're gonna wait till October of this year to have this Chazara fight, well, it will have been a full year's time since Usyk locked horns with anybody. And I don't really think this qualifies as a tune-up fight. I don't. Nah. Usyk's still acclimating to the heavyweight division. He's only had one fight here against a guy who was in no way, shape, or form a world-level opponent. Chaz Witherspoon could not pose all the resistance that a Derek Chazara can pose. No way. Will pose the night of the fight. And the night of the fight might have been a year's time since Usyk locked horns with anybody. That's not the least bit encouraging for a guy who's acclimating, currently acclimating, to the heavyweight division in what is only his second fight in this weight class. Fighting someone as rough and tumble, physical, aggressive, likes of a Derek Chisora. I mean, this fight really hasn't lost any of its luster, any of its intrigue over time. If anything, this adds to it. Boxing being the theater of the unexpected, there's always room for something crazy to happen. What if Derek Chisora proves that Usyk isn't cut out to campaign as a heavyweight? I mean, it's possible. It's not outside the realm of possibility given these circumstances. That's why I've been such a big supporter of this fight, big fan of this fight, because if anybody can give us the answers we need in regards to Usyk's campaign as a heavyweight, it really is Derek Chisora. He's not going to go out there finesse fighting, being cautious and, and being judicious. He's going to go for it, and you're going to be hard-pressed to come up with the answers. Can Usyk come up with the answers? There's only one way to find out. I want the Spence fight because, you know, ultimately, I saw a big clash between me and Spence leading into a year like this, like a 2020, 2021 kind of year. I always saw um, um, the big the big fight happening, but, you know, we were both undefeated champions of the world. And I thought that was how I was going to be introduced into Errol Spence, you know, as an undefeated uh, welterweight champion. And thus, with, with him having two titles, that we would unify the welterweight division with our, with our uh, matchup. So deep down, there's still a part of me that wants to grab my belt back and then really try to manifest um, my, my innermost dreams and my desires for the sport of boxing. You know what I think? I think that if Keith Thurman is all of a sudden keen on fighting Errol Spence, being in a pay-per-view might have a lot to do with it, that it has less to do with the competitive element, you know, wanting to test your mettle against the best and brightest fighters that are out there. I think it has less to do with that and more to do with Keith wanting to participate in yet another pay-per-view because short of an Errol Spence fight, chance of him getting back on there. You're not getting a Pacquiao rematch. I mean, we know that. Yeah. And, you know, Danny Garcia appears to be spoken for. He's supposed to be Errol Spence's very next opponent that leaves who for keith thurman to fight sean porter won't get on pay-per-view fighting him i don't see that rematch being billed as a pay-per-view or a danny garcia rematch for that matter not that that's on the table because it isn't like i said danny garcia is supposed to be fighting errol spence next if keith thurman has warmed up to the idea fighting errol spence it likely has a lot to do with wanting to participate in a pay-per-view and that now is the most opportune time to challenge Errol Spence for those two world titles. Now would be the time. The best time. The most opportune time to fight him as he's coming off that car accident. I mean, be honest. Why else do you think he's warming up to this idea? What have you known Keith Thurman to be keen on fighting Errol Spence? The last couple of years, it's been quite the opposite. Be honest. Why do you think he's warming up to this idea? Huh? How else would he be able to get back on pay-per-view? The only other option is a Terrence Crawford fight. You'll excuse me for questioning Keith's commitment to crossing over to the ESPN top-ranked side of things for Crawford fight. For belt that Keith Thurman, for some reason, one reason or another, doesn't seem to respect. Okay. Even if Top Rank reaches out to this guy, sends him an offer, it's likely going to go the way that the Danny Garcia offer went. Where'd that go? It's likely going to go where it went. Yep. Nowhere. Of course, Keith doesn't really want that fight. I don't think. In all likelihood, what Keith Thurman is going to do is bide his time waiting for Errol Spence's dance card to be free. I mean, in between time, he'll fight some, you know, Ivan Redcack 
kind of guys the same way that Danny Garcia did. What's likelier to happen, and in all likelihood, he'll get the Spence fight, because we all know the PBC plans on doing a circle jerk rotation of formality fights before they decide, if they ever decide, to make the Spence versus Crawford fight. Keith might get it feist. At this point, I'd be surprised if Keith Thurman gives Jordanis Ugas the time of day. I'm convinced that what Keith Thurman is going to do is bide his time, navigate safely, up until the point he can get that Errol Spence fight. And given the PBC's island policy, maybe he gets him. That's not a bad fight. It really isn't. But what it is, is a day late and a dollar short. There's not as much on the line in a Spence versus Thurman fight as there is in a Spence versus Crawford fight. We all know it. It's the truth. Thurman versus Spence, it's not a bad fight in all the same ways that Garcia versus Spence isn't a bad fight. It's okay. Neither of those two fights are bad fights, but neither of those two fights are on the same scale as the Crawford fight. Now forgive me for idealizing things, but I'm of the opinion that in order for Keith Thurman to earn that Errol Spence fight, he should have to go through Jordanis Ugas and let the winner of that fight challenge Errol Spence for those two world titles. That makes a lot of sense to me, you know? There's a lot of intrigue associated with a Thurman versus Ugas fight, and Ugas needs an opponent. What's stopping Keith from fighting him? They're on the same side of the street, right? And that's what we hear all the time these days. Sides of the street, your side, my side, come over, all that jazz. Keith Diamond, Jordanis Ugas, they're both right there. Yeah. That's one way you could do it. And another way is for Keith Thurman to challenge the winner of Lipanets versus Abdu Kakarov. As the winner of that fight will be Spence's IBF mandatory challenger. Perhaps Keith can, you know, fight Lipanets if Lipanets wins that fight. I say this because Keith Thurman, he's coming off a loss. That's what he's coming off of. A loss to a Manny Pacquiao who is in the twilight of his career. He doesn't need to be fast-tracked into a world title opportunity. Opportunities, because there are two world titles on the line. He doesn't need or deserve to be fast-tracked into such a fight. He should have to earn it. It's a great pity the kind of fighter that Keith Thurman has turned out to be all these years later after having unified both the WBA and WBC titles. I thought better of Keith Thurman years ago. I did not expect that this would be the kind of fighter that stands before us today. A fighter who is little more than an opportunist whose competitive drive has been extinguished over time due to one too many layoffs. But it is what it is. I don't know exactly what the immediate future holds for Keith Thurman, though I would be pleasantly surprised if he so decided to take on the likes of an Ugas. That'd be good. But one way or another, we'll find out. We always do.